Hey everyone, on this episode of Noon, I'm thrilled to introduce you to Jennifer, a healthcare professional with a diverse and dynamic journey. Jennifer's career has evolved from her early days in EMS, where she worked her way up to becoming a paramedic. Her relentless pursuit of knowledge led her to become a nurse, and she's practiced her expertise in a variety of settings. Jennifer has a treasure trove of stories from her time working in healthcare, offering a rich tapestry of experiences. Join us for an engaging conversation as Jennifer shares her journey and recounts some of these captivating stories. This episode promises to provide unique insights into the world of healthcare from EMS to nursing and the valuable lessons learned along the way. Let's get started. All right, Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us on the Noon Podcast today. Yes, of course. I'm so happy to be here. Yes, I appreciate you coming out. Can I go ahead and get an introduction of yourself? Sure. Um, well, my name is Jennifer Mazzanti, formerly Jennifer Lambert with my maiden name and pretty much my name all throughout my EMS career that most people would know me by. Let's see. I'm born and raised in California, so my whole career started out there. I got my EMT back in 2004. So I, went, I started when I was 18, and I think I, grad, I graduated with that when I was 19. I got my paramedic in 2008, so a couple years later, and then I got my RN in 2018, and I just finished up my BSN in December of last year in 2022. Congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks. It was interesting doing it after having kids. <laughs> That's <laughs> off to all those people that do that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> They're crazy. Yeah. So I worked a little bit of everything. I started off in Southern California. I was Let's see, I was 19 and my partner was 18 and we were given keys to an ambulance and we were stationed in South Los Angeles. Oh my and God. that was a eye-opening experience <laughs> to the real world. Oh, I'm sure. For, you know, there's Los Angeles County and then there's Ventura County, which is where I'm from. So it's about an hour, hour and a half north. It's like a small little beach community that I lived in that was nothing like South Los Angeles. So that was, <laughs> that was an interesting start. Um, I did that for about a year and I was really fortunate. A job came open for the ambulance company that covered my hometown. So there were three ambulance companies that worked in Ventura County and the one that covered my area where I grew up had a job opening and I took it, which was, I've heard people talk about it here before. It can be difficult because you always, you're going to run calls on people that you know, and I certainly mm -hmm. did, but it was also very, it brought a lot of pride to give back to the community they gave my family and I so much when I was younger so that was a great experience and I ended up going to paramedic school in the same county and ended up working as a paramedic for several years on the ground ambulance I did when I was still an EMT I worked in a super small role emergency department for a while I was a volunteer firefighter for about three years in my last year in California I was able to work for the sheriff department aviation unit which was essentially you were a flight paramedic and they did search and rescue all throughout the county that's really cool yeah that was really cool and it's like hoist rescues like the whole nine yards but the other cool part of it was there were the sheriff department so if they had like a high speed pursuit or they were like you know pursuing somebody on the ground they needed eyes in the air like we went and did that that's really cool yeah <laughs> and then they would always have to bring me along because if they got like a medevac now in one call they're not gonna like go back to base and pick me up and then go sure. they're just gonna bring me along and we did stuff like we would fly around the mountains and look for people's like hidden pot farms. <laughs> <laughs> it was basically us just getting to go fly around and like do all this awesome like sightseeing and occasionally. Well, that's find... really cool. So did you guys use the thermal binoculars no. to look for the pot farms? No. No, we did it during the day. Pretty much your shifts were just during the day and then people were on call at night. So it was stacked fully from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and then at night everybody went home and then people that lived within a certain response area did on-call stuff at night. But people get pretty creative. Like it wouldn't be like this perfect like square farm. It would be like two pot, like two plants creeping up the side of a mountain hundreds and hundreds of feet. And that would really? be the stuff that you'd have to look for. Yeah. <laughs> never, that is really you cool. About these things. No. What kind of what kind of special training did you have to look for pot farms? <laughs> I was just kind of there along for the ride. 
the unit was staffed with, I mean, obviously a pilot, and then there was a sheriff deputy that was a flight like deputy. And then there was the, the crew chief um, guy who was actually back in 2008 during that recession, they emerged with the county fire department. So the crew chief in the back who operated the hoist was actually a firefighter paramedic whose primary like full-time job that was their job Mm -hmm. so they didn't work like on an engine or anything they worked on the helicopter and all those guys are the ones that were you know (laughs) looking for the stuff I was just kind of there to enjoy the scenery and point things out if I saw them but no special training required other than them you know sharing their like hey these guys will typically do this or this to try to hide it and you got to look for those sneaky sneaky ways (laughs) that's a really cool unique experience it was really unique it was your scope of practice wasn't any different. It was what it was for the county. Back then, there were certain levels of paramedic, like you're starting, and then it went up to a level two, and you had to be a level two paramedic for at least a year in the county, and then you had to do the interview process and the background check and the whole thing. And it was actually a volunteer position. So mm-hmm. you volunteered two shifts a month, and it was just 12-hour shifts, and that was like the minimum requirement. You could do more, but that was the minimum requirement. So You are a lot braver than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back at my younger self, I never thought I would do stuff like that. And then when I did, it just kind of came, it came naturally. Like the first, we practiced like the hoist stuff. They had like a, a thing set up in the hangar where you could clip yourself onto it and like try to manipulate and move, the, you know, practice, if you will. But the first mm-hmm. time I was ever in a helicopter, they took me up for training and we're like 200 feet in the air and they strapped this, you know, cable hoist to my belt and told me to get out. <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> just no there's just no hesitation. Like it just did it. And it just came, it came super natural. And I just, I loved it. And that's when I fell in love with flying. Oh, you're crazy. I, <laughs> I wish I felt that way. I, cause I did volunteer firefighting too when I was younger and I will go into a burning building. No problem. Yeah. And it's not even a heights thing. I don't know. I don't know what it is about flight, but yeah, I'll run into a burning building. No problem, but you're not going to get me in a helicopter. <laughs> Yeah, it's a different different world on the rotor, that's for sure. It is. They try to convince me to get in every once in a while, and I'm like, eh, I'm good. <laughs> I'm Perfect. good. I'll hang out. Okay. Yeah, fixed swing, fix swing is as far as it'll go for me, and that works. Yeah. <laughs> I um, I have to say, Albuquerque is the biggest city I've worked in, so I couldn't imagine working somewhere in like Los Angeles where there's so many people, so yeah. many people. It was intense, and when I first started, like, GPS wasn't a thing. Like we had the old school Thomas guides mm-hmm. maps, you know, the big ones yep. you have to like fold out on your lap and figure out where you're going. And it was very interesting. It taught me direction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> something I was super bad at going in. But yeah. <laughs> that's no, I the maps, oh man, that's not something I had I've had to think about in a long time. They mm-hmm. with the fire department, yeah, we used to have to pull the maps out too because when yeah. I got into the fire department, cell phones were really just becoming a thing like I had a Nokia mm-hmm. brick you know yeah I had one <laughs> <laughs> and that thing would last through anything I mean you could drop it in water and pull it out and it'd still be playing snake <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah those old days those were good the maps were fun mm-hmm. though I think it helped create a lot of trust between you and whoever was driving because yeah. you had to depend on them to get you to where you were going <laughs> and it took some mm-hmm. skill to read the maps you know very much did i would be lying if i said i didn't get us lost once or twice but yeah well it does and it's i think it's a great skill to have yeah it's a great skill to have now i mean what if you know god forbid what if something what if a tower goes down and then all of a sudden there's no cell service and you don't have these like tools at your disposal yes good to be able to to go back to the old school ways if you will yes (laughs) at least finding which way is north and south you know Mm -hmm. So when I met you, um, it was here in New Mexico, and that was that was a lot of years ago. <laughs> a lot Ugh. of years ago. I mean, at least 10, possibly 12 years ago. Maybe. Somewhere around there. <laughs> yeah. What brought you to New Mexico? You know, I was out in California. I was still working the ground ambulance full-time, and I was flying part-time on the air squad, and I fell in love with flying, and I was like, man, I would really love to get paid for this. Like, everyone else here is getting paid really well, and then I'm just... I'm just here Having fun. <laughs> for, the, for the experience. And I had always also wanted to get my my college degree. Nobody in my family had. I'm the oldest of four sisters. I wanted to set a good example. And I didn't want to get it in something stupid. There was no degree programs 
out there. I don't know if it has changed, but there's nothing for like paramedicine. There is now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Unless there was, you know, something administrative. Like I didn't want to go run an ambulance company and I didn't want to get my degree in something like underwater basket weaving just to get it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, a very good friend of mine who was born and raised in Rio Rancho moved out to California and he got hired as an EMT at the same time that I got hired as on as a paramedic at the company that I worked for out there. And we became fast, close friends. And he's the one that told me about UNM's program. And I ended up researching it and I met with a recruiter and I applied and I got accepted and the recruiter got me in-state tuition. And mm. so I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. <laughs> that's awesome. So that's what brought me out to New Mexico in 2010. And I did a super short stint at the heart hospital. I worked doing stress test EKGs mm -hmm. for a short time. And that was just like, ugh, <laughs> it was not very fun. And then I got super, <laughs> super fortunate to get hired with a flight company out in Northern New Mexico shortly thereafter in 2010. I got hired to open our new base up, up in Taos and I worked there from 2010 to 2016. So were you driving out there for your shifts? Yeah, when I first interviewed, they're like, you know, the position's in Taos and what they would typically, the company majority operated out of Arizona. And what they would do is they would offer crew base housing because their bases were so rural that they couldn't expect people to drive, you know, hours and hours and hours in, just build a work a 24 hour shift and then drive hours and hours and hours from home. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they provide crew housing. So people would stack their shifts and they would work, you know, a 24 hour day off, 24 day off. And then they drive home for like five days and then they would be able to come back. But one of the conditions on employment for Taos was that there wasn't any crew housing. So at the time I was, I had an apartment in Albuquerque and I was commuting you know, two and a half hours one way up to Taos to work, which ended up not being my longest commute ever. Oh, <laughs> towards Towards the end of my my stint there, um, I had met my now husband, who was my fiance at the time, and he is he was United States Air Force. He's a special operations combat pilot, and he's stationed out of Clovis, New Mexico. And for the last yearish that I lived in New Mexico, I lived with him. So my commute went from two and a half hours to four hours one way. Ooh. I would get up <laughs> at like gross. one o'clock in the morning and drive four hours to work. Oh. After my apartment in Albuquerque, I had bought a house in Santa Fe. So for a couple of years there, my commute was much better. Yeah. And then I met my husband and it got much worse. Yeah. <laughs> That's a long commute. Ooh. It is up to the mountains. Yeah. But it's beautiful though. It is beautiful. I could be biased because I'm from Las Cruces, but I actually like all of the state. You know, I think it, I think driving New Mexico is beautiful. It really is. You know, my... My parents, my two younger sisters moved out to New Mexico about five years before I ever did for my dad's job, kind of ironically. They live up in the Aztec Farmington area. Mm -hmm. And I was already out of the house by that point. And I remember my mom telling me, is there any chance you want to come with us? And I was like, hell no, I'm not moving <laughs> to New Mexico. <laughs> Fast forward five years and I'm in my moving truck like, yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> Crazy where life takes you. It is. And now you're up in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So back in 2016, my husband was still in the military and he was getting moved from the Clovis base to um, Herbert Air Force Base in Florida. So that's what ultimately ended up make, um, making me leave flight was I had to move with him to Florida. <laughs> and I ended up doing a short stint, like six months or so, at a large trauma center in Pensacola, Florida. And I hated that. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, I came from like the top of my game as a, you know, a critical care certified flight paramedic. And then I'm working in this ER where I'm not even allowed to give aspirin. That's and true. I'm treated like a tech. And it was just, yeah. it was awful. So I was looking, just constantly looking for something else. And uh, I found this, you know, when you go on Indeed and you search for jobs and some stuff that's totally fake. <laughs> that's yes. what I thought. That's what I thought this job was. But it's essentially, it was a government contracted position where I worked for the Special Tactics Training Squadron out of Colbert Air Force Base, and I was their civilian paramedic. Oh. And I would go out on all of their training exercises with these guys. So it was the the SAUTI, the Special Operations Weather Guys, the TACPs, which is Tactical Air Control, 
the PJs, so the pararescue guys, and the combat controllers. So in the Air Force, going through that, you all come, they all come through this particular training squadron at Hurlburt Air Force Base, and I was their paramedic. So it was everything from, they did some pretty intense, like, multi-day land navigation stuff where they're just kind of set out in the jungle by themselves and they have to get from point A to point B to diving. So we would dive in pools. Um, there's a place in Florida called Vortex Springs, which is one of the deepest clear water diving holes in America, I think. Um, they would dive there and then they would dive open ocean. So it'd be like, yeah, on the boat, hoping they come back up. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's, um, they would do jumps. So high altitude parachute jumps onto land and onto water. And then they would do the low altitude static line jumps. And so I was just their ground paramedic for all of their training activities. That's really cool too. That sounds like so much fun. Did you do any of the training with them? Not like I never jumped out of an airplane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like sometimes they'd have to go out and they'd have to shoot all their big guns and grenade launchers and all that kind of stuff. And I had to be there because a lot of things can go wrong in that environment. And sure. they let me do all the things, which was pretty cool. That is so cool. Man, you have done some yeah. really cool things. Yeah, it was it was such a unique, probably the most like prideful job because I was getting to support these men that go and defend our country. And that was that was just an incredible experience to be able to be a part of that and to to know that I'm there to keep them safe was a really neat feeling for me yeah so and then on top of that you know my husband worked on the base so we had all the same holidays and weekends off which you know working in ems like that's not a thing yeah <laughs> so that was a that was a cool little perk for sure so what prompted you to move into a nursing position you know that stems back from when i was a flight paramedic in new mexico mm -hmm. it man it just didn't make sense to stay a paramedic my scope of practice was exactly the same as my flight nurse's scope of practice. And yet, you know, you were making eight to $10 more an hour than I was because you have RN after your name and I have medic yeah. after mine. <laughs> and ironically, I don't know, it's definitely not the same anymore. But ironically, when I started flying in New Mexico, the paramedic scope of practice was larger than the nurses because of one drug. And that, I can't. I was thinking about this the other day and I couldn't remember. I almost, I almost texted Jessica, but it was either propofol or ketamine, but nurses couldn't administer it for some odd reason. And I know that since changed because it's stupid. Yeah. So financially, it just really didn't make sense. And, you know, I had been crawling under rotor wash in negative 20 degree weather and <laughs> climbing up mountains and climbing under cars. And, and it's just like, do I really, do I want to be doing this for another 20 years? What if God forbid I get hurt or I get sick? You know, I, I feel like I've heard one of your other guests talk about this. In the paramedic field, it's just so limited. You can either be a paramedic or you can teach or you can do administration and that's it. So the diversity of the nursing field and being able to provide for my family a little bit better, is what prompted me to eventually go into nursing school. And I had started the program I was in before I even knew I was leaving flight. Um, my company had started this program, like a testing, like a pilot program where before, you know, if you got your, if you were a medic and you got your RN, you have to operate at your most highest, you know, licensure level. And because you technically didn't have experience as a nurse, you'd have to quit the company and go get experience and come yes. back. And your job wasn't guaranteed. Yes. So my company did this pilot program where if you were a medic and you went to nursing school and you got your RN license, you could still keep flying but you had to work with another nurse. You couldn't work with a paramedic. So you had to work with another nurse and it was like a year long thing. And, and you had to meet certain goals and check off all the boxes and all of that. And then you could be blessed into the flight role that you were already doing the whole time anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and practicing at the same level. Yeah. So my, my base manager at the time was kind of the pilot guy for that. And I had plans to follow in those footsteps, but my husband's military <laughs> um, move kind of got in the way of that, but I had been thinking about leaving flight anyway. So that just kind of prompted the exit. And then, yeah. <laughs> I mean, flight's hard. It's flat. It's hard on our bodies. It's there's all the vibrations, the elevation, all of that. It's hard work. And there was a, there was a back when I was flying, there was a big safety concern. We felt like every time we opened a social media outlet or a news outlet, there was another house crash somewhere. And it was just consistent back when I was flying. And then our sister ship crashed and killed 
three very incredible people that shouldn't have died. You know, you you see all these crashes on TV and your heart just breaks, but it's so far away. It doesn't feel like it could touch you. And then that was a very, very real, real, real thing. Yeah, it's definitely awakening. Yeah. So talking about shortages everywhere where, oh, you have a pulse, you have a job. There's just not a lot of, there's not enough people to fill these positions. I've heard you talk about it before. Like what's the median age of your pilot? at your company <laughs> that experience level just is not there no we were super fortunate up in our base where we created this family environment that was just incredible we had some amazing pilots who had such incredible experience and everything was just it was a very very nice little safe bubble that we had yes. and it definitely got popped when our sister base crashed and that's one of the probably the main reason I never returned to flight after I finally took the step out the door. Yeah, it's definitely understandable. We um, were one of the few fixed wings that actually flies dual pilot. So that's great. Yeah. Yes, we have a we have an older pilot, and then you know our and I've talked about this before too. Our SICs are yeah. like twenty. Yeah. <laughs> twenty one, yeah. and you're like. <sighs> You're barely old enough to drive a car and you're flying me around in this aluminum can, you know, it's, <laughs> it's crazy yeah. sometimes. It is nuts. Mm -hmm. It is definitely something worth considering. And I know that you were in that flight uh, with Jessica, for those of my followers that have listened to Jessica's episode, what were your thoughts on that flight? That was just very, at the time... You know, when you're when you're up there and, and you're doing the job, there's a part of you that kind of feels a little like untouchable, which it's a weird thing to say, but like, I'm safe, my pilot's safe, we're going to be okay. But mm -hmm. then when you when you land, you get those two feet on the ground, you're like, I was almost not okay. You know, like I was, we were, my pilot, who was amazing, could not physically let go of the controls. Otherwise, she would have lost control of the aircraft. We were getting rocked so bad. So bad up there and we were trying to help her find uh, you know a place safe place to land and when we finally found that location and we were almost on the ground i had been facing aft in the aircraft and i had been looking i had been looking out the windows and looking and just making you know doing all the things you're supposed to do looking for wires and poles and all the things because we're landing mm -hmm. at some unsecured site in the dark that we nobody even knows we're, that we're there and my hand was on my knee and I remember looking out the window and just scanning and I just remember all of a sudden Jessica just grabbed my hand and she just squeezed my hand because we were almost on the ground. We had made it. And I turned around and looked at her and we just had like shared this look of just like, holy shit. Yeah. That was, and especially, I mean, she's mentioned about the patient. He was just not critical. It was one of those situations like, why are we doing this anyway? Why are we up here? Is this worth it? It was an intense moment, that's for sure. A very eye-opening, intense moment. How long after that did you keep flying? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. I don't remember when that was, but I know that I did keep flying for a while. because I was still at the company when Jessica left. So, yeah, I would say at least another year, maybe more. And was it hard to get into and out of the aircraft, or was it, it lessened a little bit? I think it just makes you even more aware and it makes you look at things even harder and scrutinize the weather even more and ask the questions you know not just if there's questions just ask you know if you're yes. like yeah we're good to go it's like well are we good to go do we look at everything you know it opens up that communication with your team more makes you more hyper aware if anything i think those situations make you come out a little stronger so that you can get from point a to point b safely yeah it's good that you were able to get back in and continue your flight career for the year or so mm -hmm. that you did continue and that it wasn't something that just stopped you, you know? And one thing that I've learned being in flight, and again, I don't fly rotor, I only fly fixed wing, is you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And there are some times when you are very uncomfortable sitting in that seat thinking yeah. like, oh, it's a rocky day today, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So did you have any flight calls or even EMS calls that just really stick out in your mind that were good calls? Good calls, yeah. Um, it's funny how things that you think you'd never forget all of a sudden are like this blurry memory. Um, there was a call that we did 
when I was flying. I think it was around like over in the Hemis Mountains where a, a kid, I think he was around 10, he had been hiking with his dad and his brother and he fell like 30 plus feet off the edge of a cliff. I don't, I don't think they were hiking in an area that like had like a set trail. They were kind of just off doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we got overhead, they were asking us for a hoist. I'm like, we don't do that, man. <laughs> <laughs> the only people in New Mexico that do that is National Guard. Yes. They're like, we can land close by. <laughs> you know what? We can land as close <laughs> as we can get. We can land on the side of a mountain if there's enough room. Yeah. But we can't we can't hoist out. We're like, well, that doesn't sound very good. And this story is just basically about all these people that came together. It's just so cool how us and EMS just all come together to figure it out to get these patients, you know, out of these situations. And I, I'll just preface this by saying, I have no idea what the outcome of this kid is. I wish I do, but I don't, I don't. That's okay. I just, I just think in my head that, yeah, he made it. He's good. <laughs> and sometimes I think it's easier that way. Yeah. <laughs> we ended up landing and we ended up having to land in, I think it was like a soccer field or something right next to kind of where the base of operations was. And there was a bunch of guys that had climbed up the side of the mountain to this kid. And it had taken them a long time to get up there. So it was going to take them a long time to get down. And he, they were, you know, on the radio saying that he was really critical. So I turned to my partner who was a brand new flight nurse. I think this was <laughs> either her first like medevac call. I'm like, are you ready? <laughs> are you ready to do some real EMS work? Like, this is what it's all about. And we essentially just grabbed the necessities of what we needed. And we started hiking up, traversing up rather this side of this mountain where like, I'd have to give her my bag. I'd have to scale like this area and get to a spot and then she would throw up the bags and then she would climb up and like it was kind of that kind of momentum up the entire thing I think it took us half an hour close Jeez. to half an hour to get up to where this kid was and he was unconscious and unresponsive his GCS was three but he was maintaining his own airway and his vitals were miraculously stable and they had ended up calling for the National Guard for a hoist rescue and the National Guard's ETA was an hour plus. Like we had no idea. So we decided to just start moving down the mountain. And whenever the National Guard got there, we would reconvene a spot to be able to get him up and out. And so he was already in a Stokes basket and we already had, we had ropes and all the things. And so we just started moving down the mountain where, you know, before people on each side go for a little while and then the person with the foot would trail off and somebody else would come back on. And so the people weren't getting tired. There's a couple instances where we had to tie ropes to the Stokes basket and people had to jump down and we had to set up stuff to get him moved down. Thank God this kid remained stable during this process. And then we would hear a helicopter and we'd look up and we'd think it was the National Guard. <laughs> it was like Channel 4 News. And we're like, no, <laughs> we don't want to. No way. Oh, man. And the whole time we were moving down the mountain, we kept hearing helicopters. And there was like four news helicopters circling overhead. Jeez. And we kept thinking it was the National Guard. Anyway, this team of people, we got him all the way down the mountain. And when we got down the mountain, he was still unconscious and unresponsive. Mm. We kind of restabilized him down there. We RSI'd him at the base of the mountain. And as we were loading him into the helicopter, the National Guard flew overhead. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, ah. <laughs> your response time is too long. But it was just so cool how all these people came together and we formulated this plan and we wanted to do plan A, but plan A didn't work. So we had to do the plan B and then a little bit into plan C and just getting this kid successfully and safely down the mountain and being able to do that with my, my partner who had never experienced something like that. It was just, it was just really, really cool. It was really cool. I had a, there's a video of it online because it was all being filmed by the news that I had saved forever. And I looked, I had saved it and I looked at it the other day and they had finally taken it down. And I was like, no, uh, <laughs> I wanted to watch that again. It was pretty cool. <laughs> that is cool. I, I try to explain this to my new nurses. So right, right now I have a new nurse that I'm training and he is like, Sam, how do you know everybody? <laughs> and I told him, I don't know everybody. But I go out of my way to learn who people are, and especially if they're EMS, because we're all in the same thing together. You know what I yeah. mean? And he's like, nurses just don't do that. They are very known for eating their young. I don't know why. That's a prevalent problem here in Albuquerque, you know? And mm -hmm. 
he was like i just can't believe how like we'll have random other ambulances when we're at the hospital just come up and say hi how you doing like how's it going super friendly and he's like did you know that person no idea no (laughs) and we do just i think it's because we're put in positions like that where it doesn't matter who you are what you are what you look like you figure it out together Mm mm-hmm you have and, to be able to come together, yeah. Otherwise, yes. that wouldn't have worked. We wouldn't have been able to get him down, yeah. Yeah, you want you have these goals, and you are going to figure it out together, right? And it's, mm-hmm. if you're not helpful, then get out of the way. Yeah, and I will say that, you know, after we left Florida and moved up here to, to Pennsylvania, and I got my RN license, I started working for a trauma center up in the Poconos. And I had a really good experience. It definitely wasn't a eat your young kind of environment. It was very much a nurturing welcoming, you know, teaching environment, which was really wonderful. So I'm, I, I'm hopeful that that is changing because I've, I've <laughs> heard, I've heard that a lot. And even the people that I worked with up here have told me the same thing that it used to be like that really bad in the ER where you were just eaten alive every day. Yes. Instead of like mentored, which is really what you want from these, you know, people that have been doing this for 20, 30 years. Like I want, I want to learn from you. <laughs> Exactly. Like you've been here, you've been doing this a lot longer than me. Help me Mm -hmm. me learn something new today. Yeah. So are you still at the trauma center up there? No, I worked, I worked there from 2018 through the beginning of 2021. I left when I was seven months pregnant with my twin boys Mm -hmm. because it was COVID. It was insanity. (laughs) And I was, I was so very pregnant. And I talk about it a lot. You know, my husband and I struggled with getting pregnant. And I finally did. After four years, we were finally pregnant and it was twins and it's a pandemic <laughs> and I'm an <laughs> ER nurse and they had made me a charge nurse by that point. So it was even more insane. Yeah. And so I had asked for leave of absence and they denied me. And I said, okay, well, <laughs> you can give me the leave of absence and I'll come back or I can just quit and yeah, they wouldn't a... give it to me. Peace out guys. We'll see you yeah. later. <laughs> they were so... There's a lot of people that are taking leave of absences because they were scared and I get it. Yeah. But for me, you know, it was starting to come out at that point, you know, pregnant females are significantly higher risk for more severe or significant illness. And then there was stuff coming out about COVID placentas and babies having strokes in utero and mm. all these things that we just don't even have medical knowledge on yet, the research yet. And right. that was terrifying. It's like, it's not worth me losing these two babies so i left the trauma center in 2021 when i was seven months pregnant i was like who is going to hire me (laughs) like not only am i pregnant it's twins they're going to come early that's just natural yeah i found this um i found this home infusion therapy company okay and the patients the patients were perfect because they were highly immunocompromised they never went anywhere or did anything that increased their risk so they were the perfect patients for me (laughs) and (laughs) I would go into their homes and give them infusions. It's not like hydration, that kind of stuff. It was actually the one I do the most is IVIG, which is IV immunoglobulin. It's essentially a blood product for -hmm. for people with a variety of different chronic illness. And I was going into their homes. That was like my bread and butter coming from EMS. So it was super comfortable for me. And these patients were perfect because they were like (laughs) the least risk that I could take and still work. And, uh, I'm actually still doing that. I worked up until the week that I had the boys. I actually had to cancel some patients because I had I had the boys early as expected. Uh-huh. And <laughs> I took I took a year off and then I kept the infusion job. I actually see one lady. I see her once every three weeks and she gets an eight hour long infusion. And that's it. <laughs> um, after taking the year off with my boys, I really wanted to do something different. I didn't want to go back to the ER. Like going back to the ER made me nauseated to think about doing. <laughs> but I didn't want, the infusion job is nice just because it's super chill, but you really don't use any brain cells. And I'm so used to critical care and critical thinking that I wanted to do something different. And one of the things coming from EMS, I'm sure you can relate to this, babies, pucker factor. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. So it's either one extreme or the next, right? It's yes. either this healthy this healthy delivery and this beautiful baby or this brand new mom who doesn't know what she's doing and the kid's fine. You're like, you know, <laughs> or it's the extreme where the baby's dead or 
very, very close to death when you show up. And there's never anything in between. And the number of these calls are just, you get like, you're lucky if you get a handful in a, you know, five, 10 year career. Yeah. So I, that part really interested me. So I went to work for the neonatal intensive care unit and I became a NICU nurse for a year. You went just falls to the wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's such a different, bizarre world, but it was really, really cool. I really, really enjoyed it. And I think I'll eventually maybe go back, but we ended up, we ended up moving to our current house that we're at now. And it's an hour and a half South of the hospital I was working at. So Ugh. right now I am pretty much a stay at home mom, which is crazy. I never thought that would be something I'd be doing. And I see this one lady every three weeks and that's, that's it. That's enough to keep you occupied, huh? Yeah, I wanted to keep, when we were talking about, you know, we're moving and we're talking about me taking a step back for a little bit while the kids were young. It's like, I really don't want there to be this huge gap in my, you know, employment history in my resume. It's like, I sure. want to keep the infusion job. This lady, she's become a close friend of mine. I've been seeing her for two years. It's kind of just perfect in that regard. So I kept that and I had to step away from the NICU, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool. That's taking care of two two year olds now. It's challenging of itself. <laughs> in a very short few years though, you've done quite a lot. And a lot of like intense things that nobody will get to see themselves. You know what I mean? Yeah. I really I really like the diversity of my resume right now. You know, it's long gone are the days where people you know, where if you started off as an ER nurse, you were an ER nurse for thirty years. You know, yeah. it's just the thing of the past. And, you know, you've talked about it before here, you know, paramedic, you know, lengths are like two to three years when people are yeah. out. Whereas back when I started, guys have been doing it for 20 plus years and retired as paramedics. Unless you get hired on with a, with a good, you know, fire department, it's just kind of few and far in between now, for sure. It is. It is, especially for medics. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any calls that just were crazy? Like things that would probably never happen again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. I think I probably have. I think I probably have a couple. <laughs> Let's see. The first one that pops in my head back when I was a medic in California, we there were two two ambulances that dispatched to an unknown medical. So it's like usually it's just one because usually that's the BS. It's like we don't know what to call this. Just send somebody kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> And we get to the house and the other ambulance is already there and inside. And we come walking up the grass and a cop stops me and he goes, hey, we can only let one of you in. And I was like, okay, well, that'll be me, the medic. And he's like, you really need to watch your, where you put your feet and try not to step in the blood. And I was like, okay. <laughs> My partner was like, all right, I'll be back here. And we went, I went walking into the house and there was just blood everywhere all over the walls, all over the furniture, all over the floor, everywhere. And he leads me back to this back hallway where there's an open door into the garage. And there's this woman lying on the ground and she is bound and gagged and stabbed to death. And he goes, wow. we just need you to confirm death. <laughs> it's like, okay. But weren't you the second ambulance there? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm... I'm in the garage and it's dark in there. Like the light doesn't work. I'm like, you cleared this area, right? <laughs> uh, I'm standing over her and I'm putting the leads off her back. They didn't want me to move the body. Sure. And the other ambulance crew comes through the hallway with me and I just hear screaming. And it's this, I don't remember how old she was. She was a young girl. She was screaming. My dad did it. My dad did it. As they were hauling her out of the house. And what it ended up happening was the dad tied up both the mother and the daughter and stabbed the mother to death in front of the daughter and then turned on to the daughter. And I think she had 20 to 30 stab wounds, but she miraculously lived. And he was on the run. And I think it was 24 or 48 hours later, a crew got dispatched up to... Like our coverage area covered the PCH, which is, which is the Pacific Coast Highway that runs down to like Malibu in California. And there's offshoots of roads that go up into the mountains where you can get 
to the valley on the other side and or there's hiking trails and stuff and i think it was a couple people that had gone up there for a hike found the dad in his vehicle he had slit his wrist and committed suicide Jeez. so we never found out why that was probably one of the craziest calls i've ever been on that is crazy for sure there's some weird ones where we got called to a cardiac arrest for this guy he was probably like 500 pounds in his bed in those hoarder houses where you have to like walk sideways to you know get through hallways yes. and i walked into his room and he's on his bed and like well he's not going anywhere there's no way to get him out of this house there's no way and then yeah. i saw i saw something flicker out of the side of my oh god my peripheral vision <laughs> and I, t- I turned to my left and literally sam from the from the baseboards oh. to the ceiling was cages of snakes and hairless rats and tarantulas oh my god in this guy's bedroom oh, and i was no. just like mount <laughs> fire you got this right yeah oh that's creepy oh. <laughs> yeah super creepy and i'll tell you this one because it's probably the best story i have ever ever Ooh, I love this. <laughs> back in california the ambulance we got dispatched to a pediatric cardiac arrest. Probably not how you'd think I would start that story, but not at we got all. dispatched <laughs> to a pediatric cardiac arrest. Comes across as a one-year-old, not breathing. So we're going life and science to the city. The fire department's going life and science. Cops. Whenever a high acuity call like this comes through, our supervisor always got dispatched to. He's like a you know just additional assistance. Sure. So he was coming from the north end, north end of the city. So we pull down the street the fire department's already there there's like this gaggle of like 30 women out (laughs) in the street like screaming and running around i'm like oh jesus christ we get out of the ambulance and we go walking up in the fire department like i said was already there and we all know each other he goes jen the patient's over there i'm like cool man like why aren't you doing anything (laughs) (laughs) i go walking up and there's this woman and she's just crying hysterically and she's holding this blanket in her arms like a, you know holding like a baby Brilliant. in her arms yeah and i go over there and i like I rip open the blanket and it's a one-year-old chihuahua oh my god <laughs> who is very much alive by the way for all us dog lovers <laughs> so what was the I was, issue this apparently this dog had gotten like wrapped up in her curtain like around his neck and she called 911 and said, my baby's not breathing. And then when the dispatcher is asking her how old the baby is, she's like, one. <laughs> so I was a pretty like salty, crusty paramedic back then. I was so burnt out and so over it. And I just looked at her and was like, are you fucking kidding me? And I turned around and I walked away. And then my supervisor is still responding. So I get on the radio and I'm like, uh, medic 63 you can go ahead and cancel the patient's a chihuahua. I repeat, the patient is a chihuahua. I go (laughs) over the radio, and then you just hear all these clicks on the radio of, like, click, and you just hear laughter, and then they let go of the click, like, all over the county. People are... (laughs) (laughs) I forgot that that used to happen. Yes, you just do the click, like, everybody's paying attention to what's going on. Everybody can hear it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was pro- that was uh, that's probably one of my most memorable calls as a paramedic. That's fantastic. I love that. I would like to say that I haven't had any like that, but I did. I had a, it was actually kind of sad. We had an old guy that called because his dog was dying and his dog was really old. And he was like, "Is there anything that you can do?" And we ended up staying on the scene. And when I did my tactical training up here, one of the trainings that we actually got to do was canine training. So I got to learn how to like place the monitor on the dogs and then how to do IVs, oh, how cool. to intubate, yeah. how to hydrate. So I actually did, I started a line on the dog and they called for a, a vet to come out because he was a richer guy. And uh, they called for the vet to come out and help the dog pass a little more easily. But that uh, sometimes we get those calls for the animals and it's, yeah, what do you do? You racing. Know? Yeah, racing through the city, risking your life. One of the things that you talk about, too, is, like, kids. So something that happens kind of often, and I don't know if it's, like, everywhere, if it's just a thing. I don't have kids, so I I don't know. But we had so many calls where babies were, like, unconsolable, right? They were just crying and crying and crying. And one of the things that I learned very early on was to pull their socks off because they get mom's hair wrapped around their toes, and it can actually yep. cause yes and it can ac- actually like cause issues if it's not found 
Oh, yeah, you know, because you're basically digits, cutting off yeah. the circulation. Yeah, that's freaking nuts. I had never, like, you think about it and you're like, holy cow, just take the sock off and look and see if there's hair around their toes. I had told my husband about that and he was like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. And I mean, you can see I have super long hair. So every time he would find a hair, like in a sock or something, he's like, hair tourniquet. <laughs> hair tourniquet. <laughs> hair tourniquet. <laughs> the baby, when our babies were really little. <laughs> Keep the hair tourniquets away. Yeah. That's so it's a funny. real thing. Yeah. <laughs> it is a real thing. One of the other prevalent things that we hear, this is a com like complete shift, <laughs> is scrotal gangrene. <laughs> and it's prevalent here in New Mexico because of the sand. And it only takes like one or two grains of sand to actually cause that issue. But we have a lot of elderly gentlemen out here that have to have surgery or like severe sepsis workups because they get gangrene in their scrotum. You know, it's nuts. Wow. I've never had, never had one of those patients when I no, went there. No, I have to say I've had at least 10 in my career. Wow. Yeah. And I talked with one of the doctors and he was like, yeah, this is why. And I guess they get a lot of them at the hospitals here. Yeah. I had one necrotizing fasciitis and they didn't know it was neck back until later, but I had never, never had scrotal gangrene. Thankfully. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it is weird. It's just one of those things that like, it's probably really not an issue anywhere else. Uh, maybe Arizona. Yeah. You know, maybe. Maybe <laughs> working in the ER at one of the local facilities here, because you talked about working as a tech, there was one here that actually let us take patients. So we worked almost, almost to the same capacity as a nurse did. Um, there were just some certain things that we couldn't give like IV antibiotics, you know, um, mm -hmm. and then we couldn't do like rectal tubes and stuff, which was fine with me. That's why I'm <laughs> yeah. a nurse. <laughs> no, no butt stuff for me. I'm good. Uh, <laughs> but one of the crazy things that I saw there was, and I'd never seen this and I never thought about it, but you know, you learn about when you give Foley's not to inflate the balloons too much because you cause a lot of tissue damage. But yeah. for the people who have chronic Foley's, the tube, if it, it's not monitored, and we had a guy who had been in a nursing home for years, the tube had actually eroded down the urethra, down the shaft. So it was like the predator on his penis. Like, I don't know how else to explain it. It's crazy because it was almost from urethra to balls, you know, that it was just open. And Oh, that poor man. I know. And, he, and you know, he was out of it, which is good because I think that's how he is chronically. Um, so he doesn't feel it. But that was just one of those things. Aye, aye, aye you never think about and then you see it and you're like well i saw it <laughs> i can't i can't i can't, I can't, I can't, I can't make that go away that's what i'm going to yeah. think of every time now yeah <laughs> did you ever see oh, anything crazy word. in the er oh yeah we had a guy who was just walking like with his walker and he twisted his ankle and fell but he ended up amputating his like from his ankle his ankle popped out of the joint and then pent, like tore through his skin and he oh. was had such bad diabetic neuropathy that he couldn't feel it so we were like do you need pain and he'd be like no i'm good and like wiggling his leg and it's like flopping <laughs> everywhere and i'm like could you please <laughs> could you please stop <laughs> i had a i had a little girl she was like two that came in her mom was like she was breathing funny so i thought i'd bring her in he's like oh, jesus christ like why are you here and the doctor was like we'll do a chest x-ray he's like why are you even doing that this is stupid <laughs> and the chest x-ray came back and the girl had a two inch nail that she didn't swallow she inhaled it it was in her trachea how she do you getting, inhale that i don't know i think she probably had it in her mouth and either fell or something happened where it caused her to take a deep breath and down yeah. it and we're like she was like when we went in the room to go like tell her parents and like we, we'd seen the x-ray and we're like oh my god <laughs> you know, we all like she's in the room the little girl was like jumping on the bed and we're like no <laughs> Did you guys have to send her out for like a specialist? No, she got medevaced out to the the big main hospital is down in Allentown uh, where the pediatrics is. So she got shipped out. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> crazy. That's we had a patient here. I don't know how much I want to divulge on this story. Uh, it was back when I worked for an IFT company here in Albuquerque, and we got called for one of the outlying facilities. And we were transporting a patient who had been sedated for and prepped for surgery. They actually started surgery on him. And 
while they were doing surgery, they, so he, he swallowed a tent spike, like six to eight inches tent spike. And he liked to do that for fun. They were familiar with him. He's done a lot of this beforehand. Um, so they decided that they could take care of it there. And when they went in to do the surgery, they found that he had actually perfed his trachea. So they decided to send him to one of the bigger facilities because now they were like, well, this is too much. We can't do that. They thought it was just in the esophagus. And we we uh, picked him up and drove him while he was sedated on probe. We had to take the RT to keep him <laughs> ventilated. So we took basically this whole OR team and drove them to another hospital. And when we got there, they were like, oh, yeah, that's the guy. We know who he is. <laughs> Oh, God. Because they'd seen him so many times before. And <laughs> he's just nuts. In an x-ray, I mean, I don't know. Uh, would you do a CT for somebody who swallowed something that big? Like, I feel like I would. I, I, guess, I guess, yeah. I mean, if you're <laughs> stable enough and I mean, it's not an MRI, so you don't have to worry about but the yeah, metal, I, yeah, you'd think <laughs> I would. I would have done a CT. I just don't know how it took them going into surgery before deciding, oh, this is bad. We need to take him to to the other facility, you know? Yeah, well, I could, didn't really think about, okay, well, he swallowed it, but what damage happened on the way yes. to where it's currently at? There and this isn't so many more. small. This is huge. And he got <laughs> yeah. it all the way down. You know, he walked in to the ER. He didn't get he didn't get driven in. He didn't go by ambulance. He walked into the ER, said he did it, and they were like, okay, let's prep you for surgery, you know? Yeah, people put all kinds of weird stuff in weird spots. I don't, I don't, I don't understand. I've seen a lot of that in the ER. Like, why? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Like, one hole's an exit only hole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. People do the craziest <laughs> things. Very true. Yeah. Do you feel comfortable sharing um, one of your worst calls? Um. Yeah. The one that sticks on my head the most is when I was I was flying in New Mexico and we got called, they ended up calling for dual helicopters and it's kind of the base of the canyon that leads up into Taos. And it was one, it was one vehicle into a brick wall and it was like front end damage, but it was kind of like, why, like, why are we getting two helicopters? Like what's, what's the deal? And we landed and we walk in and there's the mother who's the driver and they're working on getting her out and she doesn't look too critical, but then she has two little girls in the back seat. And I don't remember their ages. I think we estimated our patient to be around six or seven. And then her sister was around the same. Like they looked like they could either be twins or they were just super close in mm-hmm. age. But our patient was, she was going in and out of consciousness and she had pink frothy sputum coming out of her mouth. And it was just Ooh. very much like the mechanism didn't look like it could have caused what we're seeing, but we ended up getting her out of the car and working her on the side of the road and then the other helicopter landed and um, took the other patient, her sister from the other ground crew that was there. And she ended up coding on the side of the road and we ended up driving her up into Española to get her stabilized. And, you know, Española is like this super small, you know, rural hospital. There's Mm -hmm. one doctor and the other crew ended up driving the other patient into because she ended up coding as well. So two pediatric codes to this little tiny hospital. And the doctor was like, <laughs> she basically, like I was running the code in the other room and she was going in and out of the other room, but the other like was like running the, running the other one. And I remember we had to, we ended up having to reintubate our patient and I reintubated her in the ER and we finally got her kind of stabilized. We had gotten ROSC, we retubed her her stats were finally good and we were just okay what's next and I remember her sister was right next to us like there's just a curtain between the two of us and I remember looking up after I'd intubated her and I was up at the the head of the bed and looking up and out and there was this man standing there and he was just looking from one bed to the next bed and he was just crying just tears flowing down his face and in this moment that still gives me chills I realized it was their dad and he had gotten to the hospital and they let him back and he was just standing there just watching his daughters it was just it was insane and they couldn't figure out why she had coded and so they ended up 
taking her in to do an exploratory surgery at Española. And they're like, can you, can you stay? Because as soon as we're done, we're going to, we want to fly her to UNM. And it's like, of course, like I, I, I remember saying, I don't want to leave her yet. And we actually went into the OR with them on standby while they did an exploratory surgery. And the other team was working to get the other girl stabilized. And we ended up transferring her from the OR down to UNM. The other crew kept trying to get her sister into the helicopter, but she kept coding. And I think ultimately they both ended up passing and it just didn't make, it's one of those calls that just didn't make any sense. Yeah. I was like, why are both these girls so significantly injured from this wreck? Cause it doesn't look like it's that bad of a wreck. And what could I have done differently to change the outcome? You know, <laughs> I remember in the back of the ambulance when we were going, we're, we're all just kind of looking at each other and brainstorming to like, okay, what can we do next? You know, her lungs don't sound that good. We don't think she's over eight, but can we put a needle in her chest? It's like, well, what, you know, what's, if we don't then, and she does have a, a pneumo or something. So we were doing all these things, just operating on the fact, like she might be eight. We just need to give her every resource that we can. And it was just one of those calls where this, man, like, why? Yeah. <laughs> Still to this day, it's just like, why? And then seeing her dad there was just, that was something else. Were they seat belted? They were. They were in like those, they were forward facing in those like booster seats. So it appeared, I don't know if they were too small for them. I think they had like blunt, you know, blunt force chest trauma and head trauma. I think they hit hard enough where they got thrust forward into the to the back of the front seats. That's really the only thing I can think of, unless something was going on before the accident, like if there's some sort of neglect or abuse, but I don't know that to be sure. Sure. And with the, the pink frothy sputum, it almost sounds like a tracheal injury. Yeah, something, something. Yeah, that's really unfortunate. Every pediatric call is <laughs> one of those worst ones for sure. Yeah, and for and for the most of us, it is peds. You know, they get us. Can we discuss a little bit about why? Because you said you were flying, so why? And I only want to ask because I think other people will ask. But why did you decide to drive in opposed to flying? So you can't do effective CPR in the back of a helicopter. It's just it doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> Essentially, you're just doing you're doing the patient a disservice. Especially nowadays when, you know, you go, I'm sure you'll probably do this now that you have your AHA cards. At least in every, like, ACLS research class I've been to and the PALS classes, now they have these dummies that show you, you know, when you're doing compressions, you're not mm -hmm. doing it hard enough. You're not doing it fast enough. You're not compressing well enough. Um, when you think you're doing, wow, I'm doing this. This is good. The patient's getting the circulation. They're getting the things that they need. And the computer's telling you you're not. It's not. Yeah. So whenever we had somebody code like if we had somebody code in the air we would have to land and do cpr call in ground support i mean if you're right there at the trauma center or something then that's that's a different story but if you're still in the middle of nowhere in order to give the patient the best that you can you can't do that in the back of the helicopter when it's up in the air like that so do you think that's something that's going to change now with like all the lucas device and all of those cpr devices I think so i mean they, yeah those didn't exist back when i first had started and we certainly didn't have them when I was flying, but I think it's a fantastic tool. I would have loved to be able to take that little girl straight to UNM. You know, that's where she should have gone, but we just we couldn't effectively get her there. So I think something like that would have absolutely changed the game. Is there any other equipment that you've seen that's come up in the last few years or medications um, that you think are kind of changing the game for pre-hospital EMS? I know that right when I left, they were starting to implement flight to be able to start chest tubes, which I think is really beneficial. I mean, the studies on it, you know, you have your increased risk of infection and all that, you're out, you know, but I think that's really beneficial. That will, will be really beneficial for a lot of patients. And then back when I was flying, we weren't carrying blood. I think that's one of the best things, especially in rural EMS is one of the best things you can do is have some sort of pre-hospital you know, blood administration protocol. So yeah, I think that that's great. I, one of the issues that I've run into out here is that a lot of these small outlying hospitals don't have enough blood. So I've transported, yeah, yeah GI bleeds who haven't received, who have H, you know, 
hemocrat and hemoglobins that are really low and they're not getting blood because the facility has to decide whether they're going to get that blood or to save it yeah to save it for somebody who might need it in an emergency situation yeah they had just started to implement something before i had left where the small rural hospital up there had like a cooler that was designated for flight oh and that was i'm not sure I left right when that was kind of getting into place. So I don't know what ended up coming of that, but that was that was one way that I think they're helping mitigate that by having something pre-designated. And then if it didn't get used, it could get re-put into the hospital circulation and then that you know thing get restocked. That's nice. Yeah. As far as other tools and stuff, I know that you know, like video um laryngoscopes. Laryngoscopy, yeah. Um, yeah. video laryngoscopes are constantly evolving and changing and trying to be you know, better and better for not, not just field use, but even in the, even in the OR, in the ERs. So I think that that's something that's constantly changing and evolving and beneficial. So I got to RSI not too long ago, and it was one of my first RSIs in the, in the field. And we had, we carry the King visions. I didn't use it. I went straight old school, Mm -hmm. got it on the first try, no issues. And maybe that's just the medic you know, stubborn side of me. I'm like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it in the airplane. And mm-hmm. we did. And it, I mean, I don't know the outcome of the guy, but ultimately the, we got him to the respirations he needed to stabilize him. And mm-hmm. uh, I think that was really cool. But the King, the King visions are really neat tools. And I know there's a lot of other versions. Yeah. It definitely takes a lot of practice with it too, because it goes against a lot of what you're taught initially. Yes. You know, and if you're not constantly training with it, you know, one of my mentors told me a long time ago that's always stuck with me is you're only as good as you train. Yes. And so if you don't, then that's how good you're going to be. <laughs> <laughs> so these tools are great, but you, you've got to be proficient with them. Is the other yeah. kind of key part to that. Don't be complacent guaranteed. Mm-hmm. So are there any other um, stories that you'd like to share before we close up for the day? Um, I don't know. Um, I think I do want to say that I think what you're what you're doing here is is really great, kind of bringing this to the forefront and bringing awareness to to PTSD and mental health and just letting people talk about stuff. You know. Thank you. <laughs> on here, I think it's really really wonderful, and I think you're highlighting something really great in that that there's this kind of large disparity between symptoms and between how things affect people. Like for me, I really. I really don't deal with a lot of PTSD and I've listened to a lot of your other interviews and there's been several people that haven't, that ha- very mild. And then there's the extremes, like the one lady you had on who very valiantly, you know, shared her story of suicide attempts that were almost mm. successful and just bringing awareness to this is really great. So just wanted to give you some kudos for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. it's It's been a very humbling experience. Um, yeah. you know, I feel, I feel blessed and honored that people are sharing their stories with me and that they feel comfortable being honest and talking about the things, the demons that they've had to battle with. And on the other side, it's actually kind of cool to see some people that are hardly affected at all, you know, and it makes yeah. you just wonder what the connection is. Like, what is, what is the difference between these people that is having mm-hmm. such different outcomes on them? Yeah, I know. It's, I think one of your other interviews, the guy had said um, a lot of how things affect you is where you're at in your life. Yes. And I feel like that is very, very, very true. As like pediatric. Somebody who's, yes, that's what I was going to say. Yes, so as somebody yes. who didn't have kids and now you have kids, do you think that changed for you? I think so. I mean, thankfully, my last pediatric code, um, I hadn't had my boys yet, so I'm thankful for that. But I know that the people that I've worked with in the past, um, that definitely affects them stronger. And that if I had to be there and there was enough hands, I would tell people that had kids, you know, just don't go, don't go over there. You know, yeah. I, I, I can take this one. And, you know, even Jessica talking about the call that she had where the little boy had the same pair of shoes that her kid put on that morning. It's just, it's very... It brings it brings things very very real very quickly. Yes, yes, <laughs> and it I does. think it I I think it does now because I think about my kids in certain situations and it just like oh, <laughs> <laughs> it changes you. That's for sure. Everyone always says that it's so cliche, but it's very true. <laughs> so what if in you know, eighteen years from now, one of your boys says, 
I want to be a flight paramedic or I want to be a flight nurse, what advice would you give him? You know, I would say go for it. And I think that that would be a great, like prideful moment for me that they want to follow in, in those footsteps. Making sure that you have a good support system and know how to how to handle things and ask for help is really, really important. I would say like some nuggets of information. <laughs> um, if you're trying to find a way not to do something, Thing, that probably means you should be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> do I have to to this person? Can we not? Like, you know, it <laughs> probably means we should. Um, always, always, always communicate with your partner. I feel like that bleeds into every part of your life. You know, your yes. married life and your family life, but also work. If you have a really great partner, you can only benefit from open communication. If you have a really crappy partner, you can probably only benefit from that too because you can stop them from doing something stupid or you can help <laughs> educate them, you know? Yeah. And just get the AMA. Just get the damn AMA. Let's say that. <laughs> <laughs> if you, I think Jessica touched on this too. If you say something, see something. Don't be afraid. Don't be embarrassed. Don't worry about how it's going to make you look. Just, say something because you never know if that could be the time that that saved your butt and i think probably the most important is you are never ever too educated to ask questions and you are never never ever too strong to ask for help i think those would be the, the two main things that i would try to drive home that's all pretty sound advice i agree you're never that's one i haven't heard yet you're never too educated to ask for questions or ask for anything um mm -hmm. that's a great one are there any services that you'd like to highlight? Um, anybody that you've used in the past or people that you know that are doing things to help other people? I don't par se know of any particular services or anything I wish I wish that I did. I think that just talking about these things to help reduce the stigma around them is important. You know, I was when I got hired at the ambulance company in my hometown, I was the only girl in the field. I was the only girl in my paramedic class. When I worked as a medic, there was one of just a handful of females that worked in the field. It was very, like you, I very much felt like I couldn't show my weaknesses. I always had to show mm -hmm. strength and I had to prove to all these big, strong men around me that I could do this mm -hmm. job. But now in today and things like this podcast, you get to hear stories from these big, strong men about how they broke down at their family's barbecue or they went home and they cried in the shower or they realize that they were drinking every night to forget the stuff that they've seen. And it just makes me sad to think that, man, how many of my friends back in the day just needed somebody to talk to and we just all never talked about it. I've been doing some sort of healthcare EMS since 2004 and you know, I've only shared three or four stories out of what, 20 years. And I have been to one critical incident stress debriefing. Wow. One, and that's not because they were offered and I couldn't make it. It's because I was the only one that was offered. And so I think people listening to this that are still in the field, you know, making, making changes and opening communication and working with management to highlight this need is one of the most important things we can do. I agree. hundred percent. hundred percent. Well, thank you for sharing that. Those are some very strong and very valid points. Um, you know, definitely opening up with your, your supervisor or your manager or a company if you're in a small company is definitely a good way to start getting that growing. And I think you had uh, talked about it in the beginning of this conversation, and it's something I've talked about a couple times, but medics working at the same capacity as nurses and not getting paid the same, you know, we need to figure it out. And I don't know how to do it yet, but I'm going to start working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the increase, I mean, I think we talked about that before too, like increasing oh, education, yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is it's such a catch 22. It's like, well, you know, I got into nursing with my, with my associate degree. It's like, well, I can just do two years of school and start working and start working for a hospital and then they'll pay for my tuition to get my BSN. You know, we're all struggling when we get into EMS and we barely make any money before that. And we don't make that great of money afterwards. So it's hard to justify putting all of this cost of education into things but I feel like in the end that's what's going to help boost this field yeah I agree I got my bachelor's a few years ago and it's in emergency medicine so 
they're out there, they're far and few between, but you know, UNM is trying to, to get it figured out and you could specialize. They had like wilderness medicine, they had tactical medicine. They had a lot of other programs too, and they had to shut it down because they just weren't getting the, the amount of money that they were wanting. So it's hopefully it'll come back and it'll be good. They still have the paramedic program, but they shut down a lot. Like they shut down the tactical program. They shut down the the wilderness program and a couple of the other programs that they had, but hopefully they'll be bringing it back. When I got in and did it, I did it at a good time. Yeah. <laughs> like right at the beginning and the, the class ratio to instructor wasn't that high. And so it was like, it was good. <laughs> we did a lot of cool stuff in that program. Yes. The advanced uh, medical classes that we took were superb. Um, very good mm-hmm. doctors teaching and very good instructors. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Well, Jen, thank you so much for coming out today. I appreciate it. It's been an amazing conversation. You've been an absolute blast. <laughs> thank you so much for having me on. When I was approached about it, it was very nerve wracking, but I'm glad I was able to come on and talk to you. And this was so fun. I'm glad I could be a part of hopefully making your podcast grow more and more. So yes, and it, it's been doing really well. And I hope that it continues to go in the way in the direction that it's going. And I thank you again so much for coming out. Um, the stories that you shared were unique stories. You've had a lot of unique experiences, which is really mm-hmm. cool. I love hearing that. And it's, it's, I think paramedics do get stuck in that, like, well, I can do one thing or the other, but I am trying to shine light that nurses and paramedics can do so many things, you know? Yeah. And making a difference. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, Jen. Well, thank you so much again for coming out. I hope you have a good day. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Okay. Sounds good. Awesome, Jen. We'll talk to you later. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. Before we wrap up, we have a few important announcements to share with you. Firstly, we're excited to announce the launch of our brand new 911 Nonsense Facebook group page. It's a community where everyone can go to connect, share ideas, discuss topics from the show, and get all of the most recent updates about the podcast. We'd love to have you join us and be part of the conversation. Next, we want to ask you to rate and review our podcast on your preferred platform. Your feedback means the world to us and helps us reach a wider audience. By rating and reviewing the show, you'll be supporting us in a big way and helping others discover 911 nonsense. If you enjoy what we do and would like to support the podcast even further, we have a few options available. You can visit samspursuit.com to find the links to our 911 nonsense merch page and our recently released noon gear page. Every contribution, no matter the size, goes a long way in helping us continue to better the podcast. We know that not everyone is comfortable being on the podcast, but we still want to hear your stories and experiences. If you have a compelling story and would like to share it to be read by me in a future episode, please reach out to us via email at 911nonsense at gmail.com or through our website's contact section. If you choose to be anonymous, we'll make sure to respect your privacy while sharing your story in a way that resonates with our audience. Thank you again for tuning in. We truly appreciate your support and look forward to bringing you more engaging content in the future. See you next week.